And we're back with more of the Pope on Film. Friday! Yes. If you're like me, you're no doubt a big fan of this podcast, The Pope on Film. It is really taking off. Last week's episode of The Pope on Film podcast, and I say last week when, in fact, we're doing the show every other week, but I, I still think, I still say last week, oh, next week we'll be doing this film, but it's not next week, it's two weeks from now. But you understand what I'm saying. I still like to think last week as in yeah. the last episode of the podcast that we did which is two weeks ago but i'm not going to say that every time so i just say last week and next week we're going to do this you understand uh our podcast is taking the nation by storm in fact last week's episode of the pope on film podcast has managed to rake in 82.3 thousand views on youtube which is absolutely fascinating i mean sure youtube says it only has five views but hey that's the liberal elite for you. That's right. They know that we, uh, Bunny and Malin, are true patriots. And what are they trying to do? They're trying to silence us. They're trying to silence true Shadow patriots. Band. Like, uh, right down here, it says, oh, how many people are watching right now on Twitch? Three. Yeah, that's just Google and George Soros. And uh, the so, so many people blame things on the Jews. Let's just let's just pick a different. Let's just pick um, the Belgian, the Belgians who are in cahoots with the lizard people and the reverse vampires, and they're fudging our numbers. They're fudging our numbers. I think that we should all just start Mike Lindelling everything. You know, We're going let's to just sue all machines. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Because because uh, we love the Jews on this channel, and it's like it, it, so many horrible people just automatically blame the Jews for everything. Oh, I woke up with a hangover after drinking those twenty beers. Obviously, you know, Jewish person must have put something in my drink. Why aren't we blaming the Swedish? The Swede? I'm up to here with the Swiss! I've had it with the Swiss! Oh, that's great. Um, But only the Just real be hard... be careful part... or we'll lose our Adidas contract. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, but only the real hardcore fans who have been with us since the beginning would know uh, two facts about us. Two undeniable, really real, and in no way made up on the spot facts about the both of us. America's hottest will they or won't they <laughs> Sam and Diane couple, Bunny and Malin. First and foremost, Bunny, is the fact that when you are not recording the podcast, you run a school for gifted youngsters. Yes. And in said school, it is rumored that everyone has power. So tell us, Professor Bunny. Do 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 do. Uh, what, what is your superpower? What is my superpower? Interesting. People don't usually start with that. Uh, I have the ability to bullshit to a level where confusion sets in, and and then I could just nut punch you. Wait, what sets in? What did you say? I know I didn't hear what he said. I'm so confused. By what he just said. I'm so confused. Oh, but, my nuts! Ooh. Thankfully, they're smaller because of the estrogen. But they still hurt when you punch them. Funny, why don't you tell us about some of your prized students at your school for gifted youngsters? Uh, I have... Uh, I have... I have quartz... Uh, he is. He can transform into a into a quartz crystal statue. Okay. okay. So pure hard quartz crystal. Uh, so it, and his brother, Cubic him, Zircona. 
it could make him a very formidable fighter, but he's in the position of a statue. He he, he can't he can't move from that position. So there's some yeah. downsides. There are some downsides. Uh, we ain't no Avengers. Uh, I have a, a a woman on our team who can transform into a gerbil. Nice. Nice. She can also communicate and command other gerbils. But they're all locked in cages and kind of useless. I mean, you know, yeah. they run on the wheel. That's about it. Uh... I there is a guy who has an uncanny knack of picking your card. Nice. Nice. You know? So so it makes a nice little distraction in a fight. He'll just run up to a bad guy and say, Is this your card? And yeah. god damn it, it was. And then that's okay. when I can nut punch them. You're not you're no Avengers, but you might be the Great Lakes Avengers. Okay. Yes, which included Maybe. Squirrel Girl. You're no Avengers. You could be Defenders. Yes, especially Netflix Defenders. We also have Funhouse. 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 Funhouse is able to transform into any image you may see in a funhouse mirror. Nice. Okay. Okay. Remember the I Metal like Men? That. Is that what they were called? The Metal Men? They, I think they were DC. It, it, Mal was telling me earlier that uh, so they're watching through Gotham. Yeah. And it's fascinating because like they don't they don't have the encyclopedic knowledge of obscure comic book characters like say you and I so they're watching the show and they're like huh that guy that character has a weird name <laughs> i've never heard of anyone named solomon grundy i'll just go ahead and google that and whoa one way ticket to spoiler town yeah <laughs> I find that fascinating because it's like, yeah, you don't know DC comics. So if suddenly a woman with black hair called Zantana shows up, like you're not going to know. Yeah. You're not going to know that if it was like a DC, if it was like a Marvel show and someone showed up and his name is Eddie Brock, like, okay, th then you'll probably know a bit more, but DC, man, it, that's what happens when you have a comic book company that started out in fucking the 1400s. Yeah. Or something like that. Like crazy old characters. And the second fact. <laughs> that you would know about me. Is that I'm a lover of history. I love it. But I'm also a storyteller. So what I like to do at this part of the show. Right here. Is I like to get a story from the history books. And maybe one that people don't know too well. And reword it via my own unique storytelling. Razzmatazz. Pizzazz. Razma pizzazz. Ooh, Ooh. I just came up with that. And that's what this is. Another educationally uneducational installment of Steve's Historic Approximations! Dun, 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 dun. Ooh, the edibles have kicked in. Or Shap, as I like to call it, repeatedly, annoyingly, whether anyone wants me to or not. Now, personally, I like the, I like the name Shap. It's cute and catchy, like me. Now, to be fair, Steve is my dad name. I have been transitioning since June. I am May Lynn now, but Shap is just catchy AF. I can't help that. No. Oh. It's just I'm sticking with 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 the good stuff. Shap. It's perfect. It it's it's a stamp. Like what are the alternatives? May Lynn's historic approximations, Millhap? That sounds too much like Millhouse, and he's the worst Simpsons character. Yes. Him and Otto. Like they Otto. can't care they can't carry a whole episode. No. Okay. So um uh anywho, uh, just to let you know, Bunny, 
later near m- more of the the end of this shap i will be doing a musical number okay okay so i will be singing a song later in this shap so be sure and stay tuned not a dry eye in the house okay. because i'll be spitting a lot during the song uh so just be prepared for that anywho this week on the old chappity shap shap we will be talking about an old timey doctor whose wise words truly touch my heart this is a doctor after my own heart and i want him to be my doctor please pretty please with sugar on top now i will spend most of this shap not mentioning the man's last name because the last name is a big time spoiler big time bigly remember that bigly so we will be calling this gentleman james h james h last name redacted which i believe that's a korean name last name redacted uh for the time being that's what we're gonna call him okay bonnie okay okay but trust me the big reveal of his name ah going to be huge it's going to be bigly huge it's going to be epic so james h he was born in 1823 in a small town called scott new york population two mules and a guy named butch he he, there's only about a thousand a little over a thousand people who currently live in scott new york small ass town but if you're visiting scott new york be sure and visit their lake whose name i can't pronounce Scanny Ad Scanny Atlas S K A N E A T E L E S. How in the heck? I even looked it up on Wikipedia, but I don't remember what I wrote. Scanetalese. Scan. It's one of the fin it's one of the finger lakes. Okay. It's one of the Finger Lakes, Rainbow Trout and Bluegill populate the lake. Also, while visiting Scott, New York, be sure and visit the Old Grout Mill. It's one mile west of Scott Village. Tell them the Pope on film says hi. You think you, you think there's a, a sponsorship opportunity here, Bunny? Possibly. 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 I, I, I am interested. I mean, we could be the official podcast of Scott, New York. I kind of want to... I keep... I I wrote every time I wrote Scott New York in my notes. This is the least writing I've ever done. I, there's a lot of ad living in this episode, and I love it. Uh, I every time I wrote Scott New York, I wrote it all in caps and super bold because I keep wanting to call it Scott's New York. Yes, but it's not Scott's. It's Scott Scott New York. But anyway, we could but be the official. But knowing that part of New York, it's probably also known as Todd. Uh, yeah. For some uh, reason, for some reason, in your more upstate regions of New York, if your name is is Scott, you go by Todd. If your name that's is Todd, weird, really? you go by Scott. It's fucked up. I don't get those people. Yeah. Yeah. I get that. So, James H., born in Scott, New York, well-off family. He went to school at a real hoity-toity private university in Troy, New York. Mal, can you do me a favor? Son of mine. Can you figure out where the word hoity-toity came from? I wanted to figure... I wanted to Google it, like, two days ago when I wrote this chat, but then I totally forgot, and I'm worried that I'm going to forget. If you don't want to look it up, at least remind me after the podcast, okay? To to find out where the heck hoity toity came from. So uh, James H went to a real hoity toity private university in Troy, New York. We could just we could just look it up right now, can't we? Well, I've got a. I, this is a big shap. Yeah, and I keep getting distracted with ad libs, and I keep getting distracted because I am on edibles. So, uh, okay. forge so, ahead then. Yeah, it's probably best to forge ahead. And if you're in Troy, New York in the fall, be sure to visit downtown Troy and take part in the annual Troy Chowder Fest with vendors, a craft fair, of course, some yummy chowder. And hey, 
There's going to be a magic show for the kiddos. Again, sponsorship. Troy, New York, give us a call. We are ready to be the official podcast of Troy, New York. I was wondering if uh, how I could figure out uh, more about Troy, New York. That's why I tuned in to Skillshare. The online, maybe we could get Skillshare too. I'm hungry. You know what I'm going to do during the break? Have some delicious Magic Spoon cereal. Give us a call. <laughs> okay, so our boy James H. James H. Last name redacted. He gets a degree. He becomes a chemist. A chemist. Because I believe that letters shouldn't be silent. All letters matter. All letters matter. Not just the vowels. Oh, vowels matter? What about all letters? So, uh, James H. became a chemist. Then he goes to Albany Medical College in 1850, and he gets a doctorate. A doctorate and a big-ass beard. If you said that James H. was in Mumford & Sons, I, I wouldn't fight you. So, now he's Dr. James H. Last name redacted. And let me tell you, Bunny, James H. Last name redacted. My favorite freaking doctor, hands down. This guy and Dr. Doom. I've always been a Dr. Doom fan. Yes. In no way a spoiler. Black Panther 2, Black Ear Panthers. Black Panther 2, even more Panthers. Black Panther into the Pantherverse. Black Panther multiverse of Panthers. No Dr. Doom yet. Okay. There was a rumor that, like, oh, Dr. Doom might appear in... No, he's not there. I'm waiting. I'm really upset because there is one actor who I have always seen as Dr. Doom. And, uh, unfortunately, Gilbert Gottfried died. So, I don't know who they're going to get. No. Maybe Stephen Wright. Stephen Wright? <laughs> Stephen Wright. Hello, Fantastic Four. I've come to defeat you. You know? That would be fun. Okay. So, yeah, so... What's Richard it, Lewis been doing? <laughs> Richard Lewis? Well, we can't get Fred Travelina. He died in 2009. That is sad, that and movie. I was a big, I was a big Fred Travelina fan. I was, I, I was. I remember their show that they it had for a while everywhere. called Copycats. Yes, yes, uh -huh. he was, he was a, uh, he was like the uh, Charles Nelson Riley of his time. He appeared on a lot of different talk shows and and whatever. He would just appear, you know. Well, Copycats had a few different impersonators fred travelina uh, frank gorshin frank gorshin Ooh. used to do a lot of impersonations nice there was a a a female whose face i could picture but i haven't thought of her name in like 50 fucking years she used to do like barbara streisand yeah and yeah so fred travelina what that have to do with anything i don't know oh uh dr doom it would be dr doom is my number one doctor ah. and then dr james h would be a very close second let me tell you why here's the meat of the shaft bunny here's the meat of the story remember i said that it'll be funny later so it's a, the 1850s and our boy james h got a doctorate now he's a doctor he's considered a pioneer in all of the websites and the Wikipedias and the, the books that I that I researched this. Okay. Because he's considered a pioneer because at the time, he was one of the first real prominent people saying like, what if, hear me out, I know it's the 1850s, what if our health is tied to our diet? And because it's the 1850s, people are like, oh, poppycock. Hogwash, poppy wash, and hogcock. Every doctor knows that digestive pain occurs when people don't pray enough. 
Now get <laughs> out the leeches! And and when I wrote that, I put a little mark, a little star after now get out the leeches because I'm thinking catchphrase potential. Yes. You know, I can already see the shirt. Yes. I can already see it. And it's the bad drawing of me still as a man. And then a, and then the drawing of you. And then in and it's the both of us yelling. Now get out the leeches. It's just an idea. Uh, because this was way back when medical medical health was all like, we have discovered an exciting new pain medication. It's right here, and it's called whiskey. Now get out the leeches, because if it's a catchphrase, you got to say it a couple of times. Yes. So I am going to be peppering it through this shaft. But you know. Dr. James H., last name redacted, was one of the first people in America to tie health with diet, and for that, he's applauded. However, he was just a tad off with his theories yeah. regarding digestive health. So cut to, it's the 1860s, and the Civil War is going on. How can I best set the stage for the Civil War? I know. I will sing you a song. Two brothers on their way. Two brothers on their way. Two brothers on their way. One wore blue and one wore gray. One wore blue and one wore gray. As they marched along their way. Mal just realized I've been singing it to them this whole time. <laughs> the fife and drum began to play. All on a beautiful morning. <coughs> that's, from, that's from the introduction to Great Moments with Mr. Lincoln at Disneyland. One was gentle, one was kind. One was gentle, one was kind. One came home, one stayed behind. A cannonball don't pay no mind. It, it's a tearjerker for a Disney ride. Yeah. You're at Disneyland. Let me get a churro, and then we'll go in here. I wonder, this is probably going to be fun, and my four-year-old's going to love it. A cannonball don't pay no mind if you're gentle or if you're kind. It don't think of the folks behind all on a beautiful morning. Big finish. All on a beautiful morning. Thank you! Thank you! Thank you! Thank you! That was from the beginning of Great Moments with Mr. Lincoln at Disneyland. A and cannonball! A cannonball also doesn't mind that you believe that you can own other people as property. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. yeah. Cannonball, a cannonball don't mind that either. He's just a dick. Tom and I, we would go to Disneyland all the time. He... It, Tom, uh, a friend of mine, totally straight, he'd be like, hey, person who I spend all of my time with, uh, how about we go to Disneyland this weekend? I'll pay for everything. I'll get you up. I'll do all of the driving. I'll take you over there to Disneyland. We'll spend the day together. I'll buy you breakfast, lunch, and dinner. <laughs> hey, maybe I don't want to drive all the way home, so I'll just buy a hotel room, and then we can just... Uh, be in the hotel room and and cuddle and uh i'm straight <laughs> it was we were just two really good friends who spent all of uh, six years together yeah. and cuddled and showered together and sometimes made out but hey that's just what two straight dudes do <laughs> but we would go to disney <laughs> shit got real so we would go to disneyland all the time and we would always be like oh man we let's just run really quick to 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 the most, important. the most important ride and we would run to great moments with mr lincoln oh shit i hope there's not a line 
That's <laughs> funny. So it, it got to the point where we would be able to sing along to the song Two Brothers. We, we would sing along like, like we're at Rocky Horror and we're watching and the time warp just came on. You know? Yeah. It's like those people who stand up and salute in a, at an AMC theater every time a Nicole Kidman starts on her bullshit. Hey, honey, did you hear any of my beautiful song? It was a great song. I nailed it. I, I, I believe that you did because you were so beautiful singing. Thank you. Thank you. Also, it is a woman singing the song Two Brothers. I don't think that song is still at, because I haven't been to Disneyland in so long ever since it became a paradise for the rich elite. Like, back in the day, you could just take a road trip to Disneyland and buy a ticket for, like, $30 and then spend the day there. But now it's it's freaking impossible, you know? Yeah, I was People can't my, afford it. I was talking to my supervisor about that. She's yeah. taking her six-year-old, her only child, to Disney World because she's, like, all into princesses and all that right now. And she yeah. really wants to give her that experience. Yeah. And so she knows somebody who goes to Disneyland and Disney World all the time, and she told her about the... Uh, discount resorts or the whatever budget resorts, yeah, and stuff. And so he's like, "Yeah, I mean, we're not going to be in the hotel room." Was exactly, yeah. <laughs> I understand that completely. Uh huh. And I, yeah. stayed at a little podunk hotel. Montana yeah. When we went to together. Disneyland, it, like we went to a place where freaking you could get shot, but it didn't matter because it's like we will, we'll be there for this much time. You can't get shot if you're not there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. You know, one thing that you don't hear a lot about when it comes to the Civil War is the food situation. Food was scarce. Yeah. Food, food was so scarce during the Civil War <laughs> that people were like, well, gentlemen, we successfully fought off the South. We, the good guys, are indeed victorious, having driven the Southerners out of this northern town. But... We haven't eaten since Tuesday. Burn this city to the ground until we have our food. So now get out the leeches. Because we, a catchphrase, you got to say it over and over again it, it, until it really catches, until it really takes off, you know? Yes. Um, it, it, let's, how about this? How about this? Funny. How about this? Now get out the leeches, church organists! Oh! Add a little bit of back history to it. That's that's a great catchphrase. Yes. Yeah. So, food was scarce as the Civil War went on, and the food they did have was getting people sick. The biggest killer in the Civil War was starvation and dysentery. So in comes our boy, our hero, the chemist dietitian, Dr. James H. Last name redacted. He says, ha, I am going to solve the food problem for the troops, for the band, for the band. So he goes to his lab. It's real impressive, just like one of those mad scientist movies. It has test tubes, beakers, and one of those electrical things that buzzes. <laughs> oh, you mean a Tesla coil? Fine, whatever. Hop to it. And then finally... Dr. James has made a decision. It is my belief. I'm trying to think of what voice James H. should have. It is my belief. Ooh, that's No, you don't like that one? I don't know. That makes me think Wilfred Brimley. Well, I mean, you might be now spot on. It's the 1850s, 1860s. So I'm assuming that everyone was 60 years old. And black and white. I'm sorry. Yes. Everyone was black and white. That's a good point. That's a good point. I'm assuming that everyone in 1860 was Wilford Brimley. I am absolutely... Yes. It is my belief that what you eat is directly related to your body's health. And so, the reason why our soldiers are dying of dysentery in such a rapid amount Damn is because... Morning. Gotcha. They're primarily eating soup and what is in the soup vegetables public enemy number one vegetables contain chemicals toxic chemicals toxic 
Those carrots are destroying your insides. Broccoli, you might as well swallow a loaded gun. Oh, your soup has cabbage? Oh, you want to eat soup that has cabbage in it? Well, I guess you'll just have to be prepared to die. Our boy, Dr. James H., thought that vegetables were dangerous. And the way to stop soldiers from dying was to start them on a healthy diet of coffee and meat. Coffee and meat. Yeah. Right. It's like, oh, yeah, well, see, people are getting cancer because of all the vegetables they're eating. Meat, red meat, gravy, coffee, maybe a couple of cigarettes that are good for your T-zone. That's tea for taste and tea for throat. Is is, uh, is he still in practice? Yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I want to track down this guy. This guy's going to be I, my new doctor. I want this as my doctor, yeah. Yeah. But see, the problem is meat is scarce. Again, food is scarce during the Civil War. But once again, Dr. James H. has a plan. Medicinal meat! Right. Now, I want to take this time to say that I'm the only person in the world that is calling it medicinal meat. There's a lot of things out there about James H. last name redacted. No one calls the meat medicinal. But this is a doctor, and he is prescribing this meat for the soldiers. Yes. It's medicinal meat. Okay? That is what this is. Okay. So, uh, James H. is like, I've got a solution. I, I know I'm saying that people have to eat meat, that the soldiers have to eat meat. And the meat that meat is scarce, but ha! I spent some time in Hamburg, Germany, and there they they eat uh, very regularly cheap, inexpensive strip steak, and they cover it in gravy. Not only will this Hamburg steak steak be cheap to purchase, but it will also make our soldiers healthier and stronger. So Dr. James H. prescribes medicinal meat to the soldiers on, during the Civil War because he literally thought that vegetables caused tumors and heart attacks and mental illness. All right. So the Hamburg steak becomes a staple among soldiers during the Civil War. And it still was a staple going into World War II because uh, Hamburg steaks were very cheap, ridiculously cheap to make. And it's like, we can't afford to give these guys hamburgers or steaks or something, but Hamburg steaks, those are cheap. We can afford that. No problem. <laughs> but it's WWI. It's WW Uno. And uh, Americans are having a problem. Because okay. it's like, wait a second. Wait a second. So we've moved past the Civil War? Yes. Okay. Uh, Hamburg steaks by James H. Last name redacted become super popular and everybody eats them. And it's something that the army continues to do after the Civil War because it's cheap and it's yummy. But now it's World War I and America has a problem. You mean to tell me that I, an American from Indiana, Rhode Island, uh, Texas, that I, I need to go to Germany and kill Germans while eating a Hamburg steak? I don't think so. <clears throat> it's like Freedom Fries. Remember Freedom Fries? Yes. It's basically that, but with Hamburg steaks. Oh, man, these steaks are really super cheap and easy to make and yummy, and apparently they help with digestive health, or so says some crackpot from the 1850s. Uh, but we can't call them this anymore. Uh, huh. We can't call our Civil War medicinal meat Hamburg steaks. We need a new name, huh? Let's just look in the book and see. Let's ship them who... to Vienna. Yeah. Let's, let's look and see, uh, who the guy was who invented these. Oh, look at that. This is the guy who invented the Hamburg steak. Uh, Dr. James H. Salisbury! Dun, 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 dun. And that's the twist. You just got shyamalan Yes. You just got shyamalan So Salisbury steak exists because a doctor from the 1850s thought that carrots will give you cancer. Yes. 
that is some fascinating stuff. A lot of times people will say that like, oh, yes, the Salisbury steak was actually named after James H. Salisbury, who uh, created it as a dietary tool to help Civil War soldiers. But not a lot of things will tell you that like he invented it because he thought that broccoli would freaking give you AIDS. Yeah. You know, yeah. like like you really got to research Dr. James H. Salisbury a lot to get the truth about what he thought about vegetables. But this is a 100% I, I, I true story. I still want story. him for my doctor. I still want him for yeah. my doctor. You know, I mean, he literally prescribed soldiers meat and coffee. Yeah. Yes. Doc, I have this yeah. cough. Well, you're not smoking enough. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, May Lin, you seem to be very depressed. Have you tried smoking more weed? <laughs> and it's like, ah, oh, thank you, Dr. Salisbury. You're the best. No problem. I'm Dr. James H. Salisbury. He's he's my he's my hero. He's my hero. He's my favorite doctor next to Dr. Doom and uh Dr. Horrible. I have to add Dr. Horrible in it. So the next time that you eat a Salisbury steak, remember these wise words. Now get out the leeches, church organists! Yes. New catchphrase, gonna sweep the nation, gonna swiffer the nation. And I know I usually say this at the end of every chat, but I'm surprised that more people don't know that James H. Salisbury invented the Salisbury steak because he thought that freaking <laughs> that freaking carrots uh, give you uh lung cancer yeah, that's some yeah. fascinating stuff uh anyway that is it for steve's historic approximations this time around be sure and join us next week for more educationally uneducational fun with steve's historic approximations and cut on that